to give the briefly the neoclassical explanation of why we need fiscal rules. The brief explanation of why neoclassicals think we need fiscal rules are idiots. <laughs> uh, to elaborate upon that, they imagine that capitalism is a barter system, which is complete active imagination. In fact, I think we should actually reclassify them under the fantasy section at libraries. Uh, but they, they believe we have an Avada system, and if you read the, the, the doyens of uh, neoclassical theory, there's one I particularly recommend called Robert Barrow, and Robert Barrow wrote a paper called The Ricardian Approach to Budget Deficit. They, they try to glamorise anything they think is going to be sophisticated by calling it Ricardian, without realising that Ricardian thought supply and demand analysis was bullshit. So, and that's your typical neoclassical economist for you. But they basically assume that at the end of time, the government must pay its debt down to zero. And we all know that. We're all rational people, and rational and neoclassical theory means being able to accurately predict the future. So with the capacity to predict the future we all have, we know that if the government runs as a deficit now, it must therefore um, create, uh, it must run equivalent taxes in net present value terms in the future. So therefore, if, we, if there's a government running a deficit, we as the private sector run a surplus instead to keep everything balanced. Okay. So therefore, government spending causes a fall in private spending, and you get no benefit at all out of government deficit. That's This is the sort of thinking. Now, somebody challenged them on that and said, well, what do people expect the taxes to fall uh, in the in the far future, so not during their lifetime? Doesn't that un weaken your argument? Now, I'm not joking. You don't associate neoclassical con economists with the concept of altruism, do you? Okay. He used altruism as his way out. He said that that argument fails if current generations give to future generations out of altruism. And that's their explanation for why the government spending is offset by a fall in private spending. Now, as I said, this stuff belongs in the fantasy section of the, of the library, not reality. But they've got themselves caught in an intricate fantasy. And that's how they see everything in the real world. And unfortunately, because they have the title of the economists, and we think they're experts on the economy, and therefore experts on money, people who don't know the garbage behind their thinking swallow this crap, and we end up with the sort of debates we get in Parliament. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dirk, um, I've heard you before um, tell the tale of how the um, EU came up with this 3% um, for, for the deficit rule. Would you like to just briefly, briefly tell the audience of the, the deep scientific and mathematical model used to work out that figure? and as a way to improve everyone's well-being. Yes, um, so this was the, the result of some Nobel Prize winners agreeing on... No, I'm kidding. Um, so um, the deficit limits, they had to be fixed at some kind of level of GDP. That was the idea. And they were then of kind of trying to understand what would be the right level of deficit to GDP. Uh, maybe 1%, 2%, 3%. Uh, they had to come up with a number this was in the, in the 1990s when they created the Eurozone rules. And um, because the French uh, had a leading hand, it was, it was because of them that the euro was introduced. Um, because they said, OK, German reunification, we can only accept if we, um, if we get a European Central Bank so that we, we don't have the problem with, with German interest rates being too high for us. And the Germans agreed and said, OK, we'll, we'll create some kind of system. And... In the end, it was some, some bureaucrat from the Ministry of Finance in France who was in the car going somewhere, um, and he was discussing, I think, with, with a colleague, so what's going to be the number that we will suggest? Um, and then they said, okay, so historically, the French public deficit rough, was roughly 2 point something percent, but at the moment, it was a little bit higher. It was like 2.3 percent. And they, say, they said, well... Um, I think three would be a good number. So because it's it would be it would be allowing the French government to be within the rules right now. And historically, they always have been roughly within the rules. Um, and then say, okay, so so roughly three percent, and and that is how they arrived at those rules. So at no point in time did they read some kind of literature or they they have some kind of paper which they use as a source. That's how they came up with these with these rules. I'd love to say that was unbelievable. Well, I, I can't. Um, uh, Alberto, if we if we could talk about an independent Scotland, um, what would be your recommendation for fiscal rules for an independent Scotland? Would you even suggest that was a concept, 
Or would you be sitting in the car going somewhere thinking of a, a magic number for it? <laughs> no. Um, with an independent currency, there would be no need for uh, fiscal rules. Government would have no re default risk. Um, we have already said the government would be a currency issuer, so default is not a possibility. Um, by the way, repayment of government bonds is not something that normally happens um, when, when bonds expire, they're issued again with the same amount. So it is, it is, you don't need fiscal rules because for a, in a monetary sovereign government, deficits do not reduce the government capacity to spend and surpluses do not increase the, that capacity to spend. Um, so really there is no need for fiscal rules, which means that really the criterion for the conduct of fiscal policy is not sound finance, but is what MMT and, and other people have called uh, functional finance. That is that a government can afford to spend what is on sale in the domestic currency. So the government can choose to pay nurses, to pay for education, and so on. And as I said, there is no need for fiscal rules. The nice thing of all of this is that he, it highlights that what the government spends on is always a political choice rather than being forced by um, financial considerations. This current plan for Scottish independence is that the, the Scottish government, once they're independent, um, would have fiscal rules um, uh, and they would actually be the uh, European Union's fiscal rules. Mm. So we wouldn't even set our own fiscal rules, we'd be using someone else's fiscal rules. Uh, and, and this is before we have our own currency. So. And Steve, as a complete outsider, does that seem to make much sense to you? And uh, there's definitely a political argument to why that might be the case, but Scotland is unilaterally saying to the European Union, we will mirror your deficit uh, and debt rules before we become a member. A sensible approach? The fear of being um, outside the norm, which I think dominates how politics behaves, and politicians, so you see with the Starmer right now, you know, wanting to say he's not going to step outside the boundary which has been set by the Tories. Mm -hmm. So, same sort of thing happened in Australia. Uh, the, the Liberal Party imposed neoliberalism and enjoyed it. The Labor Party imposed neoliberalism and apologised for it. You've still got neoliberalism. So in that sense, what you've got is just, we'll do what everybody else does. We don't want to be seen as being different or striking out. That's what's really going on there. It's got bugger all to do with intelligence. <laughs> As I said, there is no reason. The publication that I read recently from the Scottish government called uh, uh, Building a New Scotland 2022, uh, what we see there is exactly the, the reimposition of fiscal rules and that comes together with restrictions on autonomy because there is an independent um, central bank. Fiscal policy must be um, conducted along the rules of fiscal sustainability. Uh, you need to earn the credibility of financial markets so that there would be interest rate increases and there would be fiscal rules on how much a government can borrow. As I said, I can find no reasons for that. There is this sustainability conditions that are drawn by uh, comparing the rate of growth of the economy with the interest rate and, 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 and then the primary deficit. Now, the strange thing is that this comparison is made by assuming that all of these are exogenously given. Uh, in other words, the government does not control them. Um, but in fact, they're not 
predetermined because the fiscal position will affect growth and also um, a government that is monetary sovereign can choose the interest rate that it wants so it's affecting the interest rate as well. The logic of the sustainability analysis is, is, is not is inappropriate. <laughs> Done that. <laughs> see, see, does that play in? That plays to that kind of bullshit in, bullshit out assumptions, yeah, just leading yeah. to a completely false, false, false world, doesn't it? I